it's a new year, it's a new Q&A, and I've got quite a few coming from my Patreon. So I'm going to start rattling through them. I'll chapterize this as well in case you want to go and jump to one that might tickle your fancy. Um, but yeah, one at a time going in order from when they were asked. So the first one is from Attila. He asks how I would handle um, when I would undercalculate an NPC's combat skills and it is far too strong for the party. You create a scene, start the combat with this boss, bosses in inverted commas, and soon you realize he is way too strong. Uh, <laughs> I don't really play games that or run games that have this phenomenon. This is this seems to be more like something you would find in games that require a bit of encounter balance. Um, in the Year Zero engine games I run, especially things like uh, Forbidden Lands um, or Mutant Year Zero, a lot of the combatants you come up against are randomly determined by random encounters and things like that. So it's not so much a case of there being a, a random encounter you have to create and realize, oh, they're too strong. However, I do have some advice for this when this happens. Um, basically, the way I would run it is I would telegraph to the players that this enemy is very strong. And I would give them opportunities to retreat. And <laughs> if they don't, then that's their own fault. Uh, yeah, I, th I don't think it's... I mean, you've said when you un undercalculate, undercalculating makes it sound like you've made a mistake. And I don't think that is necessarily a mistake. I think having um, enemies in the world that are stronger than your PCs will make the world actually feel a little bit more dynamic and alive rather than feeling like a uh, a board game where you're – or like a video – you know, there's a lot of role-playing video games like Skyrim, for example, um, unless you mod it heavily <laughs> – where every enemy you're facing gradually levels up with you, so there's always this this balance in the world. So you're kind of you're kind of yeah you're kind of a, free to to go through the story without the world ever feeling like it's too dangerous for you. It feels like it's always kind of on your level, and the only time you're going to die is if you make some mistakes. Whereas games like yeah anyway, and there are other games, there are other role playing games that. Uh, like the Gothic series, for example, where that's not the case, and certain areas of the map are um, leveled, if you will, <laughs> beyond you. And the you know, if you face a bandit, a bandit's going to be relatively low level at the beginning, and also towards the end game, if you will, when your when your character is quite powerful, um, and that makes the world feel a little bit more alive and a little bit more normal. Whereas you know, if you're encountering a wolf or I don't know. Yeah, let's just use a wolf as an example. Um, it f it's kind of your level when you're starting off the game in Skyrim, and then when you're you know the Dragonborn and you're you know doing all the end game stuff, the end game quests, you come across a wolf. It's leveled up with you and it's just as dangerous. And it's kind of like, well, hold on, I've I've got all this amazing armor and all this amazing stuff, and I'm still struggling to kill a wolf. Like I should just be able to you know backhand it and it will be you know explode kind of thing. Um, yeah, so in my opinion, I think that undercalculating, if you if you undercalculate in a game that requires this sort of balance and you think the players are going to die um, if they really want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this character, then give them every opportunity to retreat. And if they don't, then also give them the opportunity for it to be kind of an epic fight. So make sure that there's a lot of scenery that you describe to them for them to react with. Um, to do some cool stunts off of and that sort of thing. So at least if they're gonna die, if they're gonna die, they're gonna go they're gonna go like die with style. Um, that's what I would recommend anyway. Okay, thanks Attila. Uh, Mike has a question next. What lessons did you take out of the Imperial Imperium Maledictum campaign, either from running a homemade investigation or from being the GM for an IM campaign? Now the I this I am campaign has only been broadcast the like raw footage of this has been broadcast to Patreon supporters at a certain tier. Um, the campaign is now completely finished. We've gone through eight sort of two to two and a half hour episodes, uh, so it is kind of like a full. Um, in my opinion, it's that's kind of like a full like campaign arc for a standard, you know, table experience rather than you know thirty minute episodes that sometimes I I broadcast here. 
Uh, that will be coming soon, but I'm <laughs> the editing is a bit a little bit of a problem. Um, it's just taking a long time. I haven't edited two plus hour videos in a long time, and it does take a lot of time, especially the first one. There are a lot of bits I wanted to kind of um, cut out of it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's coming soon, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. And I don't want to spoil it too much for those of you who are going to be watching, but one lesson that I did take away from it was that I knew this was going to be a eight to 12 episode sort of mini campaign or if you will like the starting campaign arc in a in a longer campaign and um, what I should have done is I should have seeded the sandbox that I created with a number of subplots that would help the players relatively satisfactorily get you know get investigate the things that they needed to investigate without overwhelming them and what I actually did is I did this thing I usually do when I create sandboxes for big epic campaigns, and that's I had a lot going on. There were too many subplots, and I think in hindsight looking at it, I probably should have had less happening because there were a lot of red herrings, which kind of works nicely or just also can help to make the world feel a bit more alive. There's other, other things happening. The players have to decide on what they're going to investigate, what they're going to be looking at, and they can't just go running after everything. Um, so I don't think that had a negative impact on things it just meant that um, it made my prep a little bit more uh, wasteful if you will because um, what I did is in between sessions I asked the players what they were going to be looking into in the next session so I could kind of focus my prep a little bit in that direction um, <laughs> what ended up happening was I had created a bunch of this ex additional content to you know seed the the sandbox and a lot of it didn't end up getting used at all um, because it was kind of there in case, well, just to make the world feel a bit more alive and, you know, dangling plot hooks in front of them for things that I thought were kind of interesting. But in the end, either were never dangled in front of them because I, I realized at some point that I had created too much um, or I dangled it and rightly so the players figured out that that, that was a red herring. Um, so, yeah, I think... That would be my lesson for this is specifically for a sandbox more than um, investigations. But uh, the cool thing about that campaign is it's the first time I've ever done a sandbox investigative campaign. Um, and it was all I did it all myself. I used the setting completely made it up on my uh, from what's well, Necromunda, but Necromunda doesn't have a lot of role playing uh, content. So I was kind of pulling lore out of some of the Necromunda books that I have access to. Um, and creating my own my own enclave in a separate, not in Hive Primus, but in a different different Hive, um, and it worked really well actually. Um, you know, most investigative games that you play, like uh, Call of Cthulhu or Delta Green or Tales from the Loop or Vazen, they tend to be fairly. Um, I don't want to use the word railroady because they're not really railroaded, but they they tend to be relatively linear. Or if they do have multiple options, the options kind of branch out and then come back together. So it's not like it's not at all like a sandbox. And this very much was designed. I I came up with a concept as a sandbox. They're in an enclave, you know, a, a big area in Necromunda, and they're investigating something. And they have there's multiple settlements. They can go wherever they want. And I've got things going on in each one that might point them in the right direction for things that you know to figure out what's going on. Um, so there is kind of like an end point. They need to find out what's going on. So that's the end point. Here's their starting point. And to get there, they can literally just go everywhere. There's clues sprinkled all throughout, um, and red herrings and yeah, all sorts of different stuff. So yeah, um, it was a lot of fun. I think that would work really well for a, a bigger campaign where like if I was, if, if I wasn't broadcasting something and had to think about, you know, keep things interesting for the channel so change the the games i'm playing from time to time um i probably wouldn't have changed much the lessons learned would be that uh more of the same kind of it worked really really well um but at the end it felt like i had this amazing content that i'd prepped they'd kind of dip their toes in it come to the end of their of their campaign arc and i have all this prep i could still use uh you know going forward and uh yeah, it feels a little bit like, uh, I don't know, it's a bit of a pity that it's it's not necessarily going to be reused. I can, of course, um, you know, grab that grab that prep and use it, change it and use it in a different game. Um, but yeah, anyway, 
that's a quite a long answer. That's really the only lessons to take out of it. I loved the um, Imperium Maledictum rule set. I did do one um, house rule, which we did halfway through the campaign when I realized that running uh, a big battle or big combat with multiple NPCs and two players is very boring <laughs> if you run it by the book. So I came up with rules for NPC versus NPC combat to make things be decided with a single dice roll just to speed up that element of it and get the focus back on the players. Um, we did kind of go back and try something different later in the campaign where the players were themselves controlling one of the NPCs, like an allied NPC. Um, so they're still kind of rolling and it'd be a little bit more interesting, but then it did st still feel like it felt like it took a bit too long. So um yeah, in terms of lessons learned from, from being the GM for an IM campaign, I think I would also continue to use that house rule. Um, and if I had a big battle to have the NPCs, NP, NPC, NP, NPC versus NPC rounds would just be handled with a single dice roll to keep things moving. Um, other than that, yeah, I really enjoyed the system. It's it's like a much better, more streamlined version of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition. Um, but set in 40k and really low kind of power level, which I really like. Uh, one of one of the things I didn't like about Wrath and Glory is it was a little bit too um, heroic, and it kind of lost its. I, I, I'm going on. A, I'm going off on a side tangent. I didn't really like Wrath and Glory too much. I felt like there's too many too many options, which kind of diluted the entire experience. Um, whereas I feel that Imperium Maledictum really hits the nail on the head for kind of gritty, uh, low level 40k. And I'm really looking forward to what, you know, more books that come out in that line. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Next question is from Your Evil Twin. In most Year Zero games, gear gives the player bonus dice. A great weapon like an assault rifle might grant three bonus dice. This also represents weapon condition. Weapons that get damaged lose a bonus die. And if you run out completely, the weapon is broken. Well, that's only true in Mutant Year Zero and Forbidden Lands. The other dice pool Year Zero engine games do not have... Um, gear that degrades uh through weapon dice um it's just those two games anyway however in twilight 2000 and blade runner weapons do not have bonus dice and in twilight 2000 and twilight 2000 has a separate step die mechanic for representing weapon condition which isn't rolled as part of an attack yep that's called uh reliability i believe the stat that's correct um, does this mean that, generally speaking, the chances of su successfully hitting an enemy and are lower in Twilight 2000 and Blade Runner than in games like Forbidden Lands, Mutant Year Zero, Alien, Walking Dead, etc.? Yes. <laughs> uh, you do roll ammo dice in Twilight 2000, not in Blade Runner, but in um, Twilight 2000. But the ammo dice, if you get successes on them, they don't count towards hitting your target. They count towards either some sort of condition or spreading the... Um, damage across multiple enemies or just increasing damage um, so yeah you're absolutely right the chances of hitting an enemy in uh, the step die systems are lower because you're not getting any additional dice from your gear for doing that that was the question that's the simple answer um, i haven't looked at probabilities for it or anything like that but it that is going to be the case i've done a, a separate video when i'm looking at blade runners step die um, probabilities and comparing dice pool probabilities to step die probabilities and uh the the numbers really are very very similar in terms of probabilities of success when you're comparing similar skill and attribute levels in both systems so when you're thinking about that and there's only like one maximum two well like one to two percent difference in the two systems you then start adding additional d6s for um you know even one additional d6 to um a dice pool game it's going to significantly alter the odds and it's going to start going up and the more gear dice you get the higher the chance uh, the, the better the chance is going to be so yeah that's how it is and uh, i don't wouldn't say that's a that's a negative necessarily it's just the, the way the games have been designed um and i do feel that twilight 2000 feels a little bit more difficult as a result of that um but there are a lot of things you can do tactically in that game to kind of make up for it which um, is all kind of left to hand waving in the more uh, lightweight, less crunchy iterations of the dice pool games. They all have their plus and their pluses and their minuses. Their the pros and their cons. Um, my favorite system probably is Alien of all of the um, 
of all the Year Zero Engine games, looking at not just the mechanics, but also the game system, or the game world, the setting, the adventures, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I just really love Alien, and uh, I think it's a really, really amazing game. That, that's not the question you're asking for. <laughs> but anyway, thanks to your evil twin. I hope that answers your question. Um, Attila is asking another question. Was there a game or a campaign that I needed to leave for whatever reason, which saddened you, and I wished I'd stayed till the end? Um, most games I've left, I've left because something wasn't right with the group. In fact, I think that's probably, yeah, probably like 90%, maybe more of the games I've left. There have been one or two where I've had to leave because of scheduling issues. Um, in fact, with, uh, my friend Ed, um, there were some online games I was trying to play with him. And just because of how busy I am, I had ended up having to having to drop out of them. So those were some. There was a Forbidden Lands game I was playing with Ed and some other people, including Harry, who's been on the on the channel quite a few times, uh, which I was really enjoying. But I had to. I just didn't have enough time to devote to it, unfortunately. So, yeah. Um, I mean, that's kind of life. It does sadden me a little bit because <laughs> it's it's quite a fun social thing to be to role play with other people and people that you you consider friends. Um, there's one instance where, um, I did leave a game and, uh, I, f I felt saddened for a different reason. Um, and that's when I was coming back into role playing in like 2008 after, you know, about a decade and a half of, of being away from the hobby. Um, and I found a local group in Bristol where I was living at the time. And it was like a meetup, a Bristol meetup. And, we were meeting in like a pub. There were several games going on and I got myself into a game of tribe eight and the GM was really good. Um, yeah. And she was also one of the very few women in the, um, in the pub at the, like in the group, in the big meetup group, uh, that I saw. It was mostly, mostly dudes, which is sadly often the case in our hobby. Um, so I was really looking forward to it, you know, um, it's something a little bit different to what I was expecting and the, the setting as well is very bizarre. She sent me a lot of like primers and gave me some information about the setting in advance. And I was, I really, was really looking forward to it. The system looked cool. Um, the setting looked cool. It is like one of the first role playing games I've, I'd played since like I'd, I'd left the hobby as a teenager. So uh, just, and not Dungeons and Dragons. So like something really kind of obscure in my head, like, oh, this is a really cool, interesting sounding game. And unfortunately, one of the other players was a really creepy guy. And um, yeah, the, the GM knew him and she kind of did rein him in a little bit, but he was just really sleazy and creepy. And um, yeah, I didn't go back for a, the, the next session. I kind of made my excuses and, and didn't go back and looked for another group. Um, and that kind of saddens me because uh, the game was really cool um, and the game was really cool. I, I don't remember much of it now because it was quite a long time ago and I only played like a single session. And most of that session, most of the memories are of this creepy dude and how he was kind of interacting with me and the other players. Uh, so it kind of ruined, ruined that. But it kind of saddens me that I didn't get to experience more of Tribe 8 because it, it did seem like a really cool game. Um, although having looked at it a few years ago again... I don't think it's really something that I would play these days uh, for a variety of reasons, but really one of the big ones is like the system. I'm not that keen on it now that I've, I've kind of really gotten deep into the hobby. So yeah, that's, um, I guess, uh, a couple of questions, a couple of answers to your questions there. A couple of examples, Attila. Thanks. Um, now I've got a, I've got the kind of a similar question from two people. These are the last two questions. Um, one's from Martin, which asks, what are your opinions about the newly announced the old world uh, role-playing game, which is the new Warhammer fantasy role-playing game. Um, and Mike asks, similarly, Matt, what are your opinions on the recently announced Warhammer the Old World? Have we reached peak Warhammer RPG with multiple iterations of fantasy and 40K rule sets? So I'm going to combine these together and just give my thoughts on 40K, uh, sorry, on Warhammer role-playing. Um, now, for those keeping count, there are now, well, there will be when the, when the Old World releases, four official current Warhammer role-playing, yeah, Warhammer Universe role-playing role games. For 40K, we have Wrath and Glory, and we have Imperium Maledictum. And the the way those two kind of differenti differentiate themselves is that Wrath and Glory... Oh, I for completely forgot Soulbound for um, Age of Sigmar, so we actually have five. And um, 
Wrath and Glory and Soulbound have are kind of similar that they have multiple power levels that you can kind of tweak the, you know, how heroic you want your campaigns to be. And they're kind of like a big toolbox where you can kind of mix and match whatever you want. You can have in a 40k game with Wrath and Glory, you can have an orc and a and a Imperial Guard and a an Inquisitor all in the same and a Space Marine all fighting together against I don't know who <laughs> chaos maybe um, whatever the whatever the GM thinks up and that kind of works in the rules and they have power levels to kind of make that work. Um, but you can also try and do low level or low power games as well. And my one time running that game, I ran the graveyard shift uh, free quick start uh, scenario. And I tried running it with the lowest level power level you could. And it just felt like D&D to me or like a, an alternate take on d and I was not taken with the mechanics. I really thought the mechanics were not very elegant. They felt there were a lot of weird things going on with it. Um, I did a big review of it for the Mud and Blood podcast, which I was running at the time, and it was my most hated review from my from my like from my perspective I'd ever I'd ever given. I really kind of um, laid into the uh, system because I just really hated it, um, and I didn't like how it kind of was trying to be everything. Um, it kind of lost its identity a little bit, and <coughs> and yet I think it kind of appeals to people who want that big heroic. Um, game and players who want to do this like max like do if they played 40k and they have their favorite army like i'm i i love the orcs i have all the orc minis yeah my my friend over here he loves the imperial guard he's got all the imperial guard um army stuff minis um codexes or whatever they're called these days um army books so how are the two of us going to come together and try playing a 40k role-playing game? Well, I really want to be an orc. I really want to be in an orc campaign. But he really wants to be an Imperial Guard and wants to be an Imperial Guard campaign. And then our friend over here, you know, he likes the Space Wolves or whatever those 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 Space Marines are. And um, he really wants to play a Space Marine. He wants to play, play a wolf or, whatever, you know, whatever. Um, so how are we all going to come together? We've all got our favorite mini. Like, this is my character I'm going to bring as well, right? Um, <laughs> and that game lets you do it. And it makes no sense from a role playing perspective. It is targeting people who are into the for into the war game and allowing them to bring their their favorite factions together to an extent and play them together. But I think that makes it lose its identity. Um, and it kind of reminds me of of Dungeons and Dragons to an extent, where um, most Dungeons and Dragons campaigns that I've come across, people come up with their character in isolation in a vacuum. And that's why you end up having parties of like, here's my tiefling bard with a backstory of four pages. And then the next player is like, oh, here's my here's my Goliath barbarian with also with four pages of of background. And then the next person's like, oh, yeah, I made a I made a halfling um, swarm druid. And I haven't I haven't thought of my backstory yet. I just thought it looked cool or. Um, you know, I, I, I spend about four hours in forums looking for the perfect, like, druid build. And you're like, you know, as a DM for Dungeons & Dragons, you've got to pull these really weird characters together and make a campaign. Like, how do they work together? Like, it, I don't know. For me, if, for me, it kind of, I kind of hate that element. I like having a strong group, group concept before character creation starts. Um, and in the games I run, I tend to pitch a campaign at a specific no, a specific player group and say, this is what the campaign's going to be about. Often I have the group concept built into that. Um, so like with Imperium Maledictum, as, as an example, when I was running that, one of the way character creation is meant to happen with that game is that the uh, character, the players choose their patron together and then they roll up their random like backgrounds and stuff. <clears throat> And then they they're kind of determining what their campaign is going to be about. But what I did is I picked the pa I picked the patron, and I said, "This is what the campaign is going to be about." And then I let some of the details of the patron I let the players decide on that. Um, but then when they were creating their characters, they had to think about, "Well, okay, I'm I'm in a, like a private investigator working on behalf of the merchant guilds of Necromunda. How does my concept work into that?" And I kind of came up with some tools. In fact, my my session zero is bringing all that together basically for for the campaign, and you can watch that on the channel. Um, but that's how I prefer to do things, and I don't think that Wrath and Glory really really addresses that. It just allows 
I mean, a, a GM can basically just take that toolbox and say, right, we're going to be running a game where you're Space Marines, make your Space Marine character. But because the the way it works, they would there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of variety between the different archetypes. So it's kind of designed in a way where you want to have like a Space Marine plus a um, Adeptus Sororitas, the Sisters of Battle, whatever they're called, um, plus a Adeptus Mechanicus character so you kind of like like in war like in dnd where you need to have like or other role playing like uh, online role playing games who's the tank who's the healer who's the damage dealer um and who's the the backstabbing sneaky high dps character that sort of thing right um it's kind of it feels like it's designed around that and i just don't like that I, I prefer my role play to be very narrative and that's where imperial maledictum fits in imperial maledictum is very much aimed at the story side of things the patron the patron comes with a lot of narrative hooks that bring the players together who they're working for and also is a great tool for a gm who doesn't really know what they're going to do with um with im to you know have the players kind of dictate what they want to play um and it's also very low level so there it's just dripping with flavor and theme and um it kind of everyone it all comes together you can only play humans so that you're not mixing together like xenos and humans together and kind of weird you can mix a lot of different factions together so you could still have like someone from the um imperial from the um adeptus mechanicus alongside um well literally anyone from within the human sphere of of 40k <coughs> so i like that a lot more um soulbound is kind of just a weird thing where it feels like D&D it feels like it's targeting D&D but I really like so but it does have different power levels as well that you can play with um but if you want to play epic fantasy I personally think it's probably the best epic fantasy um or like heroic fantasy uh rule set out there right now it's really good I've played a couple of sessions with my home group when it first came out and I really, really liked it. It's a it's a dice pool system, a D6 dice pool system that feels kind of similar to the Year Zero engine. Um, it's a little bit crunchier than most of the Year Zero engine games, but you kind of need that for like a sort of like tactical um, heroic fantasy. And yeah, it does it really well. The The setting is, is absolutely bonkers. It's just very weird. I didn't get my head around it when we played. Um, so if, for me, Soulbound isn't really a game I would ever play because I'm not that keen on the setting. Um, and what I think now, look, so talking about those and putting those to the side now, we come to Warhammer Fantasy uh, prior, you know, pre -age, um, age of Sigmar, you know, end of the world, end times, the world, you know, everything it kind of smashes up and goes into this crazy setting. So Fantasy is basically fourth edition Warhammer Fantasy roleplay and the newly announced The Old World. And how are those two going to exist in the same place simultaneously? That's the question, right? What is the old world going to be? And <coughs> I look at the other offerings they've done, Cubicle 7, and I think they're going to use it as a medium for... Um, I, th I think they're probably going to do two things. I think they're going to create an alternate rule set to, f to 4th edition because they kind of have to. Um, and they're also going to create content that will be usable for fourth edition i think if people want to play in this earlier time um in this er earlier era of the of the warhammer fantasy um history i think i don't know i don't know about that last part but i do think they're gonna be making a new rule set and when thinking about what they're gonna do i think they're gonna be going with something that's a bit more heroic because that's that's the opposite to what fourth edition is fourth edition is very much um mired in the mud initially at least where you it, it should take you a while to work up the careers up to getting into the kind of very powerful advanced careers um but if somebody plays D D and they want to play in the warhammer like let's say there's a there's a there's probably a lot of war gamers who played uh, who are going to be playing the old world but they're also D D fans they're probably never going to play fourth edition because they're going to it's so mired in the mud um, it's so low powered that D and D players are probably gonna be like, "Oh man, this is really depressing," and I'm failing like all my roles, <laughs> um, <clears throat> which is a which is a a thing, you know. Warhammer, it, like Wolfrop, is full of just failed roles, like a lot of a lot of like gritty games are. Um, 
which isn't a bad thing. It's just a very different play experience. So I think I personally think that it's gonna be it's gonna be targeting the the Warhammer Fantasy setting at D and D fans, and I hope they're going to use the what they're calling the C seven D six system. So Cubicle Seven's D six dice pool system, which is used in Soulbound, um, because it's an in house system. It feels really elegant. It feels really nice, and I just love dice pools, of course. Um, <laughs> so if they do that, I'll be really happy. Um, however, I did find a blog post from last September where Cubicle 7 said that they're um, looking for writers to help them with some of their C7 D20 systems. So they're basically taking the D&D 5th edition, um, like open license now, whatever it's called, and they're creating their own games like Victoriana. And there was another specific one they mentioned I've forgotten. And they said, plus some upcoming unannounced titles. And... The only thing they've announced for the C7 D6 one, one that I hope they're going to be using, is the second edition of the Laundry RPG. So I kind of because they're because they're using both dice systems in their in-house systems, theoretically in-house fifth edition isn't really in-house in my opinion, but they they have these two dice like systems that they're kind of working on themselves, applying to new games. It could go either way, I think. Um, and I think I could see the temptation of creating the old world as a fifth edition, D and D fifth edition rule set. I just really, really hope they don't because if they do that, I'm not going anywhere near it because I'm just not a big fan of of how fifth edition works. Um, so yeah, th those are my opinions. Those are my thoughts. Those are my speculations on the old world. And to answer Mike's last question, have we reached peak Warhammer RPG with multiple iterations of fantasy and 40k rule sets and Age of Sigmar? I think the only place left until we hit peak is if they come out with some Age of Sigmar second one. Because then there's two two role playing games for 40k, two for two for fantasy, and then Age of Sigmar only has the one in, in you know in the middle. Um, so, I, but Age of Sigmar is pretty epic and heroic in its scope. So I don't really see them doing something different with that. Um, and the rule set is pretty amazing anyway. So I think I think this is probably going to be peak Warhammer uh, role-playing right now. But uh, well, we'll have to wait and see. I don't know. They might, they might come out with something else. Um, anyway, that's it. I've gone on quite a long time this month. So um, that's it, though. We've come to the end of the questions. So thanks very much. If you want to ask me questions and have them answered in this sort of rambling manner in future, uh, join my Patreon. There's links in the description. And um, yeah. I put a call out for questions at the beginning of every month and I will answer them like this over video for um, anyone, any one of my patrons who asks me a question. Anyway, I'll catch you next month. Eh, catch you next month. Thanks.